Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the ACOM OSHA Injury and Illness Record Keeping Process webinar. Today's program will provide you with an overview of the basic OSHA record keeping rules and requirements, underlying concepts, case analysis process, and recording criteria. Today's program is being recorded. There is one and a half hours of CME and MOC credit for this program. You received a verification form for today's instructions, or you can follow the link that was in the instructions. No certificates will be sent to you, but your transcript of this and other OCOM educational programs can be viewed and printed from the ACOM website. Members and non-members can both view their transcripts directly from the website. Today's program will consist of about approximately 60 minutes of lecture, questions at the end. We will address questions as time permits and suggest that you submit your questions early for consideration. We are only accepting questions electronically. On the screen, you can see how to open the question box in order to submit your questions. This was also in the PDF file of your handout you received with the instructions. This educational activity spanners and the presenters have indicated that they have no disclosures to be made. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to today's moderator, Dr. Robert McClellan, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Community and Family Medicine at Dartmouth Medical School and Medical Director, Employee Health and Safety Dartmouth at Hitchcock Medical Center. Dr. McClellan, you may begin. Thank you very much, and uh, good day to you all. Um, as mentioned, I'll be serving as the moderator of today's webinar. My chief goal today is to help uh, organize your questions for a present, uh, presentation to the faculty and to be sure that we keep on schedule. Um, in addition to my current role, uh, relevant to uh, today's webinar is the fact that um, I was a former president of ACOM, and in this role uh, three years ago, I first developed an intense interest in opportunities to improve OSHA record keeping. In my travels to ACOM components around the country, I heard from many members that were feeling pressure from some employers to diagnose and treat injured workers in ways that appeared to be motivated, motivated by the employer's or the employee's interest to avoid an OSHA recordable. This finding led ACOM to conduct an open forum on our website and at a national ACOM conference to discuss the role of occupational medicine physicians in contributing to the accuracy of occupational health and safety statistics. Further work along this line included ACOM testimony at a congressional hearing addressing underreporting. The congressional inquiry ultimately led to a GAO report that was published in 2009. In brief, this report corroborated what ACOM members had been telling me. The GAO found that many factors affect the accuracy of employers' injury and illness data, including disincentives that may discourage workers from reporting work-related injuries and illnesses to their employers, disincentives that may discourage employers from recording them. And these disincentives for reporting and recording injuries and illnesses can result in pressure on occupational health practitioners from employers or workers to provide insufficient medical treatment that avoids the need to record the injury or illness. From its survey of U.S. health practitioners, the GAO found that over a third of them had been subjected to such pressure. Other factors that may affect the accuracy of employers' injury and illness data include a lack of understanding of OSHA's record-keeping requirements by individuals responsible for maintaining the law. I'm happy to report that OSHA largely concurred uh, with uh, the GAO's assessment and has begun to implement several of the report's suggestions. Today's webinar addresses one aspect of, of the ways that we, as occupational medicine physicians, can help improve OSHA record keeping by understanding the mechanics and rules of the standard. To use Dr. Beecher's words, we will also reaffirm the principle that the occupational physician's first responsibility is to treat the patient and not the OSHA law. This particular webinar follows a highly successful session at the last AOHC on the same topic and precedes a full day course on the topic at an upcoming AOHC in Florida on May 1st 
and Dr. Beecher will tell you a little bit more about that at the end of today's uh, webinar. Um, now I'd like to introduce today's faculty uh, who are eminently qualified to be uh, teaching this course. Uh, uh, first off the block will be Dr. Patrick Beecher, um, who is currently president of the Beecher Advisory Group in Traverse City, Michigan. Uh, the Beecher Advisory Group provides corporate medical consulting. And Dr. Beecher is a former group medical director of corporate medical operations for General Motors Corporation and former medical director of occupational health and safety for the Ford Motor Company. Um, a fellow of ACOM, Dr. Beecher is also a past president of the Michigan Occupational and Environmental Medicine Association. And over the past 20 years, Dr. Beecher has spoken at national conferences on the subject of OSHA record keeping and has conducted record keeping training for companies, organizations, and associates and associations. He's also assisted in the settlement of a major federal OSHA record keeping citation for a Fortune 5 company. Um, next, you'll hear from uh, Mr. Stephen Newell, who is an attorney um, who serves currently as a director of the Environmental Health and Safety Networks of ORC Worldwide, located in uh, Washington, D.C. ORC Worldwide is a global consulting firm that services more than 130 large multinational corporations on safety, health, and environmental matters. Mr. Newell has worked with member companies on record keeping issues for more than a decade. Prior to joining ORC, he was a member of OSHA's executive staff, where his responsibilities included the OSHA record keeping system and national data collection efforts. And prior to that, he headed the ongoing safety and health programs for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where he authored um, the famous OSHA Blue Book, that, known as the BLS OSHA Record Keeping Guidelines for Occupational Injuries and Illnesses. Uh, Dr. Beecher. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. McClellan, for your introduction. Over the next hour and a half, we will talk briefly about the background OSHA record keeping, case identification, work relationships, new versus continuing cases, the additional recording criteria, also known as the severity criteria, documentation, audit, and then we'll take your, your questions and answers. As with all products and services today, I, I must cover a disclaimer. We are not from or authorized by the federal or state government to give official interpretations of the OSHA record keeping guidelines. Only OSHA can do that. If what you hear today departs from the manner in which you comply with your OSHA rec record keeping regulations, I strongly suggest you discuss it with other individuals at your company, your legal department, or contact federal OSHA for advice before making changes to your record keeping process. Our talk today is based upon our many years of experience working with companies and with the federal and various state governments concerning the regulations. Let's talk a little bit about what uh, OSHA record keeping is and what it is not. OSHA record keeping is nothing more than a set of rules and exceptions to the rules. OSHA record keeping is not a system designed to indicate that, the, that an OSHA violation has occurred or that an employee or an employer was at fault or that an employee is entitled to workers' compensation benefits or to other benefits. From a medical standpoint, the OSHA record keeping system is not always logical, does not always make sense, is not always consistent, and is not always intuitive. And I think it's very important to, to remember that this is not a medical system and we can't look at it from a medical perspective. Steve's now going to talk a little bit about the background of OSHA record keeping. Thanks, Pat, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to take just a few minutes to, to provide some background information uh, on OSHA record keeping. The bulk of the presentation is going to be uh, about around applying the criteria that determine which cases go on the OSHA log. Um, but to a certain degree, I think this background helps uh, <clears throat> explain um, some of the reasons why, why companies struggle with this stuff, and uh, I think it's, a, it's an important kind of foundation for the rest of, of our session. Um, basically, the, uh, why do you keep OSHA injury and illness records? Well, because it's required by law. Sections 8C2 and 24A of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of, of uh, 1970 specify uh, what types of cases have to be recorded and uh, I identify the, the purpose for, for collecting that type of data. Um, the specific requirements are codified in 29 CFR Part 1904, 
and that regulation has been in effect uh, for, for over 30 years. It was There was a major overhaul of the regulation in 2001. Um, who has responsibility for record keeping? The responsibility is ultimately the employers, and uh, the employers have uh, have the accountability for making good faith record keeping decisions that are consistent with the rules for recording cases. Now employers can re rely on others for input in their various sections of the regulations where they basically uh, state that something is considered a day away from work case or something that involves restricted work activity or medical treatment um, based on either what was done or on what was prescribed by a licensed healthcare uh, professional. And so, um, you know, they, they can rely on others for assistance in making the decision, but ultimately the decision and the accountability for OSHA record keeping uh, lies with the employer. Now, you know, th this is an important slide, and it's not necessarily important for, for the, the stuff that was on there, but it, 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 the, the words that are on there, um, but it, it's kind of the underlying rationale in that, you know, I work with, uh, probably a, a 120 plus large global corporations on a variety of health and safety matters, and and one of the things that that I work on is with them is is OSHA record keeping and safety and health performance metrics, and and we get calls and emails every day from companies that are struggling as to whether or not to record a, an individual case, and I think and there's and I'd have to say that of all of the calls and emails that I get, I probably get four to six phone calls or emails a day, every day. Uh, probably on half of them, the person calling me really knows the answer to the question, but they're getting such grief from their operations leadership at the site um, that they need some kind of verification. And, and I think here's what you need to keep in mind. The primary purpose of the OSHA system was to produce aggregate national and state statistics. It really wasn't designed to measure performance at an individual site, and so to you know to a certain degree, um, to and and when the system was implemented, you know basically it wasn't just applied to large corporations. It, you know you were also asking you know Steve's corner garage with a dozen mechanics to determine whether or not a case was work related and recordable. So so the definitions were by in, intention very broad. And the idea that there too was to not only capture hardcore cases, but see if you can identify some emerging conditions. Now I've been in this business a long time. I've been doing this stuff for, I've been working on health and safety issues for over 30 years. I've been working on record keeping probably for 25. And you know, when I first was involved with record keeping issues, the leading occupational illness that was reported in this country was dermatitis. Why? Because you could pull somebody's sleeve up uh, and, and see a rash, and so you know over time that's changed. You know their, their focus uh, has shifted to to MSDs and and other conditions, and um, and and part of the reason is is that the system was designed with very broad criteria to capture emerging conditions, and so here's the rub, and maybe the purpose of this slide. In a nutshell, what you've got is a system that's designed to capture aggregate data by industry, and to be inclusive enough. That it might that it may capture emerging conditions, which means capture conditions that may or may not be directly related to work that can be relatively minor, and so it was designed for for surveillance, um, but it's being used by companies and by the federal government to measure performance and for accountability purposes, and that's where I think a lot of the friction around the system arises from. Now, OSHA has uh, focused on record keeping enforcement, and I'll touch on that briefly. Um, basically, OSHA collects data from 80,000 sites each year in what they, is termed an OSHA, the ODI, or OSHA Data Initiatives. Uh, they use that data to target inspections. And so they target inspections towards uh, high-rate work sites. They visit probably of the 80,000, they probably conduct inspections in four or 5,000 of those, but they contact uh, through the mail, probably another 10 to 15,000. Um, and as part of the uh, the Office of Management and Budget clearance for that in, uh, for that data collection, they've been conducting 250 structured audits every year. 
uh, by audits, I mean audits of the injury and illness records. Um, also, whenever an OSHA compliance officer goes on site, um, they basically are required to look at the OSHA log, and they can expand that and do a records review if they think things are not uh, are not the way they should be. Now, OSHA in, in the past has relied on employee complaints, and frankly, in the late 80s, there was a big push on record keeping quality, and um, OSHA ended up citing of the Fortune, let's say, 200 companies, probably 100 different sites. Uh, for record keeping violations where each case not recorded on the log was treated as a separate penalty, an egregious willful record keeping citation policy. Uh, and some of those citations were, were for multiples of millions of dollars. Virtually every one of those citations or inspections that was initiated during that period came from an employee complaint. So they can trigger that. Um, What's underway now, and it's the last bullet on this page, is there's a national emphasis program uh, on, on record keeping. The NEP is, is uh, if you read the, the write-up of the NEP, it's couched in terms of a statistical study. Uh, it was launched in September. It's supposed to take a year. It's, it is scheduled to be completed September 30th of, of this year. Um, and the objective is to assess employer underreporting uh, by conducting records audits in, in low-rate facilities. Now, um, they basically have identified the scope of their records inspection in terms of the sites to be included uh, and it, by referencing a, a table that, that the Bureau of Labor Statistics produces. But I've got to tell you, they've shared the uh, NEP audit methodology with all of their compliance officers. And so uh, in terms of an NEP inspection, um, we have members who are getting NEP records inspection that are, that are outside uh, the scope of the OSHA National Emphasis Program. And I guess the bottom line for me w was even though the stated purpose of the NEP is to collect data, um, this is an enforcement action. And I think what the agency is looking for are a few good examples of underreporting um, where, where they can basically issue significant fines and penalties and provide focus attention and provide incentives for, for employers to do a better job. Uh, one of the reasons uh, Bob mentioned there was a GAO study that had findings that there was significant underreporting that healthcare practitioners are under pressure uh, to, um, uh, to provide medical treatment that's not recordable. Um, in, in addition to that, there have been studies that have been conducted in the past um, that showed that there was uh, with estimates of underreporting that ranged from 25 to 68 percent. And so, there, you know, OSHA is really responding to a lot of different pressure. And parenthetically, I ought to mention that the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for, for Federal OSHA, Jordan Vera, was the author of a, of a congressional report around underreporting that was issued in June of 2008. So there's a lot of focus uh, in the agency on underreporting right now. With that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Pat, and he's going to launch us into uh, case analysis. Okay, thanks, Steve. Uh, basically, we're going to uh, cover quickly the case analysis. It's a four-step process. We'll talk briefly about is there a case, is it work-related. Third aspect, is it a new case? And lastly, does it meet one of the specific severity criteria, also known as the additional recording criteria? They're the same thing. So you need to have those four steps in order. And we will uh, we'll go through those quickly. Again, this is this is OSHA record keeping in a nutshell. If you know the rules and regulations and the exceptions to the uh, to the rules uh, from this slide, you can do an excellent job uh, with OSHA record keeping. So let's start out first in what a case is. Case is an abnormal condition or, or disorder experienced by the worker. Uh, the definition of what is an abnormal condition or disorder uh, that OSHA uses is, is the one in which a worker exhibits signs or subjective symptoms. And it may be just as little as the person says, I have pain in my wrist. And you find no physical signs, uh, but the fact that they have subjective symptoms would make it a case. So it's a very broad definition for what is a case. In terms of cases, you should consider injuries, acute and chronic illnesses, just pain, as I said, uh, employee allegations, and symptoms that are entirely subjective. When you do have a case, 
uh, it always requires you to look at further and get some investigation. The fact that you have a case by itself does not mean it's recordable. So you'll have a lot of cases, some of which may be recordable if they meet the other three steps, and many that may not be recordable. Safety termination is not affected by fault, preventability, worker missteps or mistakes, horseplay, or illegal activity. And I know for a lot of the medical professionals, this is a tough pill for them to swallow because when they talk to their management and the management says, well, hey, wait a minute, the guy was uh, high on drugs or the guy was um, fighting with a fellow worker and nothing to do with work or out in the parking lot. It doesn't have anything to do when you make your determination uh, if you have a case. So again, fault, preventability, worker missteps or mistakes. They may not be wearing their, their PPE, personal protective equipment, doesn't matter. Uh, if they have an abnormal condition or disorder uh, with symptoms or signs, then you do have a case. Uh, the, there is no connection between OSHA record keeping and workers' compensation. As you know, workers' uh, compensation is different for all of our states, uh, so they're not connected. Um, it doesn't mean the case is preventable. It doesn't mean that benefits are due to the, to the worker if you have a recordable case and does not mean that the employer or employee was at fault. Steve's now going to take us through uh, work relationships. Steve? Okay, thanks, Pat. Now, you know, again, the, the, the flow chart here that, that we've laid out for you is kind of the structure in the way that you analyze cases. And when I train on this, I always talk about this, Pat's heard this ad nauseum. Is, you know, this is like a series of toggle switches. You know, did you have a case, yes or no? Was it work-related, yes or no? Is it new, yes or no? Uh, does it involve one of the severity thresholds, yes or no? Now, for a case to be recordable, you have to, it has, the answer has to be yes to every one of those boxes, or otherwise, you know, turn off the lights, the party's over. You, you don't have anything to record. So we're focused on the second toggle switch, or the second box, is a case work-related. And, you know, this is, for me, uh, you know, again, I deal with probably four to six calls or emails on record keeping every day. You know, it's kind of, I do a lot of other things. My passion is elsewhere, frankly, but um, it's kind of like flossing your teeth. You know, I get that out of the way early in the day, uh, and then I move on to my, my real job. And, and I got to tell you that most of the calls or emails I get are around this one issue, is the case um, work-related. And frequently, it, you know, I, I think it's, it's not an intuitive um, set of criteria. And I, I think it's incorrectly made often by the uninformed. Um, but it's not that hard. You know, you need to keep in mind that for a case to be work-related, it's not activity-based under the OSHA system. It's geographically based. I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit uh, more about that as we move through this. Um, it doesn't have to be, a uh, case doesn't have to result from some defect in the work environment. You might even have scenarios, like Pat mentioned, where employees are either doing activity that's not sanctioned, they might even be violating uh, administrative rules that the company has laid out, and you can still have a, a recordable case. Doesn't necessarily, the OSHA criteria don't necessarily make sense from an accountability and performance metric perspective, but if you go back to some of those earlier concepts that we tried to lay out uh, for a surveillance system and for the, the real purpose that the system was designed, the OSHA criteria, uh, do seem to make sense, at least they do to the agency. So how do you determine whether a case is work-related? And there are really three different areas of analysis, and they're fairly brief, um, and I think if you get these concepts, you're going to be right about, you know, 80% of the time or, or better. Um, in longer training sessions, usually what Pat and I will do is we'll lay out case scenarios where we kind of tease these things, and we actually show you how to apply the rules to different fact patterns. We can't do that today, but we can show you uh, where we are. And so the three areas of analysis are, are start out with a geographic presumption, then you deal with concepts around work contribution, and then there are nine specific limited exceptions to the rule, and I'll touch on each one of these uh, briefly. In terms of the geographic presumption, and this is where you start, under the OSHA system, work relationship is presumed for injuries and illnesses that uh, result from or connected to events or exposures occurring in the work environment. Now, the, the word presumed, we put in quotes because it has legal significance. And really what, what a presumption does as a legal term of art is it shifts the burden of proof from the government to the employer. 
So in this situation, basically what we're saying is under the OSHA system, if you have an injury or illness uh, that's connected to an exposure in the work environment, the government's going to presume that that's work-related unless you, Mr. or Ms. Employer, can prove uh, that it's not. You know, n not a hard concept to grasp, but it, it has a very significant impact in terms of uh, which cases go on the OSHA log. And again, you know, since it's geographically based, um, you can have an employees that are on site that are doing activities that are not connected at all to work, and you can still end up with an OSHA recordable. Okay, that's concept number one. Concept number two has to do with work contribution. Now, and intuitively, if you were thinking about cases um, that were going to be used for accountability and for performance measurement, you probably would only want to capture cases where the work uh, exposure was the major cause of the case. You know, but that's not the OSHA system. So under the OSHA system, for most cases, a case is considered work-related if an event or exposure in the work environment contributed even slightly to the resulting condition. Now think about that if, uh, in, in the context of MSD cases in an aging work population. And think about it in context, and maybe in the context of an old dog like me who does heavy lifting and work around the house on the weekends. You know, I, I might end up doing, you know, the weekend warrior type scenario where um, I might end up doing something on a weekend that puts a stressor on my, my lower back. Um, and I might go to work and do something relatively minor like bending over to pick up a box of uh, Xerox paper and experience a significant back pain that results in medical treatment or days of restricted work activity. Even though the major cause of that back ailment would be the stress I put on my back over the weekend, that, would be, that case would be considered OSHA recordable and work-related. Why? Because the exposure in the work environment contributed to the condition. Again, doesn't make much sense for accountability purposes. If you're into surveillance, that it probably does make sense. In terms of, of work contribution, there are really two flavors of analysis. One has to do with most cases where a slight contribution is sufficient. The other has to do with pre-existing personal conditions. And a pre-existing con personal condition under the OSHA system is defined as a, as a condition that resulted from uh, total, total personal exposure, one that was not work-related at all, and it also includes conditions that result from exposures with a prior employer. For those conditions, basically, a uh, case is considered work-related only if it's significantly aggravated by a workplace event or exposure. Well, how do you determine whether there's a significant aggravation? Basically, you apply what, in legal terms, what the old law school term was a but-for analysis. You know, would the case have occurred at the same time with the same degree of severity, but for or without the exposure in the workplace? Would the case have occurred, same time, same degree of severity, without the event or exposure in the workplace? That's how you answer that test. Again, you only apply that test to pre-existing personal conditions or pre-existing conditions that did not result from an exposure with a current employer. Now, I mentioned earlier there are, are uh, nine limited exceptions to work relationship. Um, basically, you can't take the logic for one of these exceptions and apply it to another similar scenario. And for each one of these exceptions to apply, all of the elements of the exception have to be present. So for instance, uh, the first one, workers present in the work environment is a member of the general public. Um, basically what that means is, you know, an example would be, let's say that I work for a department store um, Monday through Friday. I come in on the weekend. Uh, to do some personal shopping, and for some reason I'm injured. Um, I'm there as a member of the general public. Anybody else could be there doing what I'm doing. Um, that, then, then my activity would be covered by this exception. Symptoms that surface at work solely due to a non-work-related event or exposure. I really think that the reason why OSHA implemented this was to get at some of the weekend warrior issues, uh, but frankly I think it has very limited application. You know, so let's take the same scenario I mentioned earlier. You know, I'm working at home on a weekend. I apply. I'm building a stone wall. I like to do building projects, as Pat knows. Um, I come to work on on uh, Monday, and um, 
unless initially as I'm coming, you know, kind of going through the door, I tell my supervisor uh, that I've injured myself, um, I'm not sure that this exception would provide much relief. In short, uh, it's symptoms that surface at work solely due to a non-work related event or exposure. The deeper I get into the shift, the harder it is to make the argument that, that my injury or illness is solely due to the non-work exposure. Number three, solely due to voluntary participation in wellness programs, physical uh, fitness, uh, medical or recreational activity. Uh, number four, solely due to eating, drinking, or preparing food or drink for personal consumption. Now look at the words there. It's eating, drinking, or preparing your own food or drink. It doesn't mean that, you know, cafeteria accidents are not recordable. Um, number five, per solely due to personal tasks on company premises performed outside of assigned working hours. Now, by personal tasks here, they don't mean normal living activities associated that you do when you're at work, like, you know, going to the uh, canteen or going to the restroom. They're really talking about things like working on your kid's science fair project, um, working on your own car, and by performed outside of assigned working hours, they don't mean on a break. They really mean before um, and after work. Number six, solely due to personal grooming, self-medication for a non-work-related condition or intentionally self-inflicted injury or illness. Just a, a brief story, I had a client call me once where uh, an employee had gone to work after he'd had an argument with his wife or spouse or significant other, and he punched out a wall and broke his hand. And so the client said to me, um, well, do you think that's work-related? And I said, well, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's covered by this intentionally self-inflicted injury or illness part of the exception. They said, well, would you check with OSHA? I said, I don't think it's needed. And they said, well, would you uh, go ahead and check anyway? When I checked with OSHA, they said the exception did not apply. And the reason is is they felt the employee punched out the wall in a fit of anger and didn't intentionally mean to hurt themselves. It just shows how narrowly the agency interprets these exceptions. Uh, number seven, motor vehicle accident in a company parking lot or access road during the commute to and from work. For that exception to apply, uh, you have to have all three elements, motor vehicle accident, company parking lot or access road during the commute. Uh, number eight, common cold or flu. Um, there wasn't a question around H1N1 and whether or not OSHA considered that to be covered by this exception. And at least uh, up until recently, I don't think they've changed their position, although I think they were rethinking it. Um, they, they considered H1N1 to not be common flu, and uh, therefore uh, it could be OSHA recordable. And number nine, mental illness uh, is not considered work-related unless the employee volunteers a written opinion issued by a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a psychiatric nurse practitioner uh, that the condition is work-related and that the, uh, one of the severity thresholds for the case have been met. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pat, and Pat's going to cover new case determination. Great. Thanks, Steve. Well, again, as Steve mentioned earlier, there's, this is a four-part process. You have case. We've talked about that. It's got to be work-related. The third thing that has to be met before you even consider a case recordable is not a new case. A new case occurs under two scenarios. One, the employee has not had a recordable injury of the same type that affects the same part of the body, or the employee previously had a recordable injury or illness of the same type that affects the same part of the body, but recovered completely and an event or exposure in the work environment caused the signs and symptoms to reappear. Okay, well, if you've got recordable cases and the person has continuing symptoms, they're considered continuing or open cases. In the past, through discussion with OSHA, although we received nothing in writing, in, in the past, OSHA would consider cases to be closed once the severity criteria or the additional recording criteria, same thing, were no longer being met. That, that was some time ago. These people are no longer at, at OSHA. Currently, OSHA is looking at a case that can be continued to be open as long as the person has signs or symptoms. The problem is OSHA gives us very little guidance uh, in determining when a case ceases to be continuing. So my suggestion is you may want to get a medical opinion uh, that a case is still uh, open, that it's still the symptoms resulting from that original injury or illness. Uh, also, ongoing medical treatment is going to be indicative of a continuing condition. 
But the longer the time between symptom episodes, the more likely the second episode is a new case. But again, OSHA right now is not giving us good guidance on what is considered continuing symptoms. Is it pain or discomfort once a month, once a week, once an hour? Uh, it's, I think you need good documentation uh, in order to continue to consider an open case. But you no longer need to have one of the severity criteria being met. Uh, for instance, you may have been on prescription medication for pain. Now you're on uh, over-the-counter Tylenol. In the past, one might have considered that then to be a closed case, even though they're having some aches and pains. That is no longer the case. Uh, OSHA would consider somebody with, with continuing symptoms to be a continuing or open case. So we'll stay tuned to that. We hope to have more discussion with OSHA in, in, in the future. The fourth step that has to be met before you have a recordable case, does the case meet one of the specific severity criteria, also known as the additional, one of the additional recording criteria, and there are seven of them. First one is death. The second one is days away from work. Days away from work occurs when the worker requires a full day away from work beyond the date of the recordability of the injury or illness. Third, days of restricted work activity. They occur when the worker is unable to perform all routine job functions or work a full work day. Remember that routine job functions are defined as work activities the worker performs at least once a week. The fifth of seven is medical treatment. OSHA considers anything that is not on their specific finite first aid list, which is, includes 14 items, to be medical treatment. And we don't have time today to go over that, that uh, finite first aid list, but there's 14 items on the finite first aid list, and anything that occurs that is off of that finite first aid list is considered to be medical treatment. Loss of consciousness, uh, again, it may be loss of consciousness may last for a couple seconds, a couple of minutes, or an hour. If anybody loses loss of consciousness for any amount of time, whether you as a medical person consider it significant loss of consciousness from a medical standpoint or not, it meets one of the criteria. So any loss of consciousness uh, is one of the severity criteria that would then make a case recordable. And lastly, number seven, and again, you only need to meet one of these severity criteria to make the case recordable. Number seven is significant diagnosed work-related injury or illness, and this must be diagnosed by a physician or other licensed healthcare professional. Uh, many times you'll see PLHCP, that's what it stands for, physician or other licensed healthcare professional. Uh, for the following work-related conditions, that's cancer, chronic irreversible disease, fracture to cracked bone, and it may be a very minor, maybe a hairline fracture, maybe a tough fracture, that's still considered uh, recordable, or a punctured eardrum. There are four conditions that have unique recording criteria, and uh, the first one is bloodborne pathogen exposures. Uh, I really suggest the people go to uh, the OSHA website, www.osha.gov, and print off the flowchart for bloodborne pathogen exposures. It makes it very clear what needs to be recorded and what does not. Uh, again, I've had many physicians argue with me that the fact that uh, the way the government has done it, they don't agree with it. However, this is the regulation and you just need to follow it. This is not a medical system. It doesn't necessarily meet medical criteria of what you consider to be a significant bloodborne pathogen exposure. So follow the pathway uh, for recordability on this one. Second is medical removal, and this has to do with medical removal uh, such as exposures to lead or mercury. If there is a requirement for an individual to be, to be removed from an area because their blood tests indicate they're over the cutoff level or so forth, then you have a recordable case. Um, if you voluntarily remove somebody before they get to that level that requires medical removal, it is not recordable. Third uh, condition with a unique recording criteria is tuberculosis. Again, much like bloodborne pathogen exposures, if you get somebody that comes down with tuberculosis at work, I would suggest you go to the regulations and print off the flow chart that leads you to recordability and non-recordability. And the last one I've got here is hearing loss. Again, we unique recording criteria. The thing to remember here uh, for hearing loss is you treat each ear independently, and if you have to change the baseline, you change the baseline only for that ear. Uh, you do it separately. Each ear is, is taken separately. 
And we include it here in, in when you get your handouts uh, off the website, uh, just a flow diagram for recording for hearing loss. Uh, again, the flow chart that you just merely follow the steps and it will give you the answer to whether you have a recordable hearing loss or whether you do not. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about documentation and uh, about auditing. Steve? Yeah, thanks, Pat. The, the intent uh, behind today's session is we wanted to provide an overview of what the rules require, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, the OSHA emphasis on enforcement and, and maybe how you can address some of those issues and prepare for that, and then leave enough time that we can ask or answer questions that you might have. So I encourage you, um, uh, Bob McClellan is, is going to kind of triage the questions and prioritize those that are coming in. But if, if you have a question about any of the areas that Pat and I are covering, I encourage you to uh, submit those in, in writing, and we'll try and respond to those uh, after the session closes. Well, okay, so so why do you care about building a good case file? I can tell you um, with my experience in working with companies on record keeping, at least with our members, um, who include some of the more larger, I started to say more sophisticated, I don't think that's a fair statement, let's say some of the, the larger employers, um, that our guys do a very good job of documenting the cases they choose to record. They do a lousy job, generally, of documenting the borderline cases um, that they don't record. And that's where the citations get issued, and that's where the problems arise. So for me, uh, documenting uh, cases is critical, and uh, you want to especially do that for a borderline case. Now, in the 25-plus years that I've been dealing with record keeping, one of the things that I've counseled companies to do is, when in doubt, put a case on the OSHA log, and if you don't think it's recordable, draw a line through it. You know, why is that a useful technique? Um, because it makes it almost impossible for OSHA to issue a willful citation against you for that case because, you know, you're not trying to hide that case from anyone. It's on the log. You've just drawn a line through it. And what you should have is then a, a file somewhere that explains your logic for not recording uh, the case. Now, I, I realize that that's more work up front, and, and, uh, but I think it ends up equating to less uh, grief um, later. And the bottom line is, is that once you've been trained on OSHA record keeping, you kind of have a feel for this stuff. And I, and I think, you know, if in your gut, you know, you're, you're being pushed or, or you think, you know, there's, there's folks who are telling you not to record a case, you know the basic rules. And if it doesn't feel right, um, and you know how inclusive those basic rules are now, if it doesn't feel right, chances are um, it belongs on the OSHA log. And if you can't document why it should not be recorded, um, then you ought to record it. Uh, well, how do you audit OSHA records? You know, the audit methodology that OSHA is using under the NEP is based on something that I helped build probably in 1987. And uh, it has three parts. Um, basically, they do a, a review of the records where they come in with to a, like a bricks and mortars type business. They'll come in with medical access orders and subpoenas and they'll subpoena personal medical information for a sample of employees. Uh, and then basically what they do is they, they construct a new log independent of the old log, and then they sit down and compare the new log to the existing log and try and identify cases that were not recordable. Um, one of the things that they're doing uh, under the current NEP that's a little different than in the past is they're doing extensive employee audits, uh, uh, employee interviews. And so employee interviews are a bigger part of the OSHA audit protocol than, than used to be. Well, how can you self-audit your own records to uh, prepare for, for a visit by OSHA or to just ensure you're in compliance? Well, one of the things you can do is the OSHA NEP uh, procedures are available on, on uh, OSHA's website, and you can download those and basically use those worksheets and questionnaires. Their, their NEP not only does an independent records uh, review, um, but they also uh, question the, the person responsible for keeping the records and key personnel at the site about their understanding and knowledge of the record keeping system. And those questionnaires are available and they're pretty useful. Um, my belief is you can't effectively uh, 
review the, uh, the OSHA log without looking at non-occupational information. Um, frankly, a lot of companies try and audit their records or do self-audits by matching their OSHA data system to their workers' comp data system. And my experience over the years has been that when you do that, um, basically all you're doing is, is you're, you're looking at a, a, a set of cases that the company has already agreed that are work-related. And as, as you'd recall, you know, the, when I did the section on work relationship, I think that's the biggest area of confusion for employers. So you need to look at non-occupational records. Now, I've had some medical folks push back on that when I've told them um, that they need to look at non-oc records, saying, well, you can't get access to that stuff because of HIPAA. Well, lo and behold, there's a specific exception at HIPAA for OSHA record keeping. Um, so you can get access to that information. It's not always easy, um, but, but you can do that. And again, the, the idea, at least the principle that I tried to put in place when I was on OSHA's executive staff about auditing the records is I'd rather have a thorough review of a sample of the employee files than to have a cursory review of all of the files. So sampling um, is very useful, and again, that's built into the OSHA uh, audit protocol. Um, in terms of, of correcting the OSHA records, you know, I've, I've dealt with this for years, um, and I, I know that you can get, there seems to be a short-term fix every time the government focuses on this stuff. And, it, you know, people can be trained, um, and, uh, you know, when, once you know the rules and you've suffered through a course like the one that Pat and I are doing today, um, you can analyze cases. But uh, to me, the, the conflicts and the problems with record keeping are going to continue unless businesses uh, and your business really deal with the root cause of, of, the, of all of the churn and the consternation. And the root cause, my, my belief, is has to do with company performance metrics. And then in safety and health, for better or for worse, and I think it's probably for worse, most companies use the OSHA data as the only metric to drive and gauge safety performance. And they do that at the site level and they do that at the company level, and they benchmark, our members benchmark each other on their OSHA rates. Um, and so, you know, you end up with scenarios where people start managing the OSHA log rather than managing workplace safety and health. And the real fix to the, to the problem, I think, is dealing with the root cause of the problem, which is the metrics issue. One of the things we've done at ORC is we're, we're pushing our companies to, to assess and reward leading indicators as opposed to looking just at the OSHA data. And so we've developed tools uh, that help our companies benchmark key elements of their safety and health management system. And there are other things that you do around identifying and managing risk uh, that, that you can drive metrics off of. But the root cause of the problem, I think, is the metrics issue, and I don't hear OSHA or anybody else really addressing uh, that. So with that, I will turn it back over to Pat. Okay, and Steve, he'll thanks. summarize, I think, some of the steps we've covered today, and we, then we can open it up for questions. Okay, quickly uh, go through just a summary of the four basic steps. Uh, and again, each of the four basic steps must be met before you have a reportable case. Uh, first, just remember you have to have a case, abnormal condition or disorder. It may be subjective symptoms only. If you have that, then it's, you have to decide is it work-related. There are three things. Remember about work relationship. One, geographic presumption. An event or exposure occurs on company premises and results in a case. The case is presumed to be work-related. Again, it puts the onus then uh, back on the employer to refute the fact that it's work relationship. The, it, uh, it may be also recordable under work relationship if the person is off-site working in the best interest of the company. Um, and we didn't have time to get into the home away from home uh, scenarios, but uh, a home away from home, once the person checked into a motel or hotel uh, while off on a work-related trip. The hotel or motel is, scenario is just as if they were at their own home. So you can have somebody off-premises, if they're working in the interest of the employer, uh, while they're working, uh, be considered work relationship as well as events or exposures that occur on work premises. Uh, second thing under, under uh, work relationship, remember uh, Steve talked about workplace contribution. If you have an event or an exposure that causes or contributes even slightly to a case, the case is work-related. Thirdly, remember uh, for work relationship, there are nine exceptions to work relationship. 
and they are interpreted very narrowly. And all aspects of those exceptions must be met in order to utilize that exception for work relationships. Remember on pre-existing personal conditions, those are the conditions such as heart problems and things that the employee brings to the work site. They're only considered work-related if they are significantly aggravated by a work event or exposure. And significant aggravation occurs when one of the seven specific additional recording criteria or severity criteria, they're the same thing, would not have occurred except for the event or exposure they experience in the work environment. So those, so that's work relationship. Remember, three things to consider under work relationship. The third step is do you have a new case. Uh, and that's new versus continuing cases. If there is no recordable case in the past for the same body part and the same conditions, you have a new case. Uh, you can also have a new case if there was a recordable case in the past for the same body part and the same condition, and the employee's condition resolved and recovered completely, and an event or an exposure in the work environment causes the signs and symptoms to reappear. Again, the government right now is not giving us a good definition of what recovered completely is. Uh, how frequently you have to have the signs and symptoms, or maybe how frequently you have to use the uh, PRN uh, prescription medication, we don't know. So uh, again, um, they've got to recover completely, and a new event in the, or exposure in the work environment causes the signs or symptoms to reappear, then you have a new case. And lastly, you have to meet one of the seven specific severity criteria or additional recording criteria, uh, death, uh, days away from work, days of restricted work activity, job transfer, medical treatment, loss of consciousness, or a significant work-related injury or illness uh, diagnosed by a physician or other licensed healthcare professional. And again, those number seven of that is uh, work-related cancer, chronic irreversible disease, fracture or cracked bone, or punctured eardrum. In addition to the four steps, remember there are four conditions with unique recording criteria, uh, bloodborne pathogen exposure, medical removal, tuberculosis, or hearing loss. Now, as a final note, uh, I always say this when I do my training, we are healthcare professionals, and as such, we have the legal, moral, and ethical responsibility to treat our patients and treat the employees appropriately. The bottom line, I feel, is you must treat the patient and not the laws. So don't worry about the laws. Do what's right for the patient. If you do what's right for the patient, it's in the best interest of the company, it's in the best interest of the patient, it's in the best interest of everyone, and you prevent the person from maybe going on uh, to long-term restriction, disability, or surgery. Um, now, I think it's time to address our CME questions. The questions are going to appear on the screen as polling questions. We ask that you submit your answers by clicking, clicking the button next to your selection. We're going to ask five questions, and we'll discuss the answers uh, at the end. Uh, while you are answering these questions, I think probably one of the um, best things to do, one of the best uh, gains for you as an audience out of this is, is asking your questions to us. And, and uh, everybody seems to learn and enjoy this part. Dr. McClellan is going to uh, moderate in terms of uh, passing some questions back and forth between Steve and I. And I think this is a very uh, fruitful part of our, our discussion today. So, Dr. McCallum, while people are answering uh, their CME questions, would you like to uh, take a look at what questions have been submitted and ask uh, Steve or I uh, to respond? I sure would. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Steve and Pat, for giving that uh, great founda foundation for what we have now is uh, 30 minutes to uh, stump the chumps. Uh, so. Please do um, um, offer your questions, uh, send them in through the website, and um, I'll review them and, uh, and uh, send them on. Uh, so the first question is um, to Dr. Beecher. Um, if there are cases of skin disease, uh, such as scabies in the workplace, and other employees are put on prescription medicine to prevent symptoms of the rash and kill the mites, in case they do have them, is that recordable? And, and Pat, you might want to expand that just in general to the use of, we'll call it kind of post-exposure prophylactic uh, measures or medication. Okay. Um, the first step of our uh, four-step process, this is an excellent question, we get it all the time, but the first step of the four-step uh, process of uh, record keeping to decide if you have a recordable case is you have to have a case. 
the case is an abnormal condition or disorder. So if someone is put on medication uh, that does not yet have an abnormal condition or disorder, uh, that doesn't uh, then take it down to be work-related. It may be work-related. Uh, if they don't have a condition, you can't actually have work relationship at that point. But um, again, if, if you don't have a case and you're put on medication, uh, it's not considered a, a, a recordable case. You're not going to get a recordable out of it. Now, having said that, bloodborne pathogens, you can have uh, 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 an exposure with bloodborne pathogens. It's the only entity we have in ultra record giving, you can have an exposure uh, to bloodborne pathogens and maybe have to receive uh, hepatitis B, um, and that would require that. So it's a little different for bloodborne pathogens, but in general, uh, if you don't have a case, if you just merely have some exposure uh, and you're given medication, it does not make it a recordable case. Pat, can I, can I expand a little bit on bloodborne exposure? Sure. You know, what, what it is is that in, with the bloodborne exposure incidents, if you have a cut or a needle stick from uh, a sharp that's uh, contaminated with blood or other potentially infectious material, what Pat's saying is right, then, then you have a recordable case, even if there's no symptoms resulting for the affected employee. For virtually everything else, uh, the employee has to have symptoms or have a case. Um, before you, you even enter into the, the decision-making process about whether something's recordable or not. So, and for, for other kinds of bloodborne exposure incidents, you know, a splash, uh, uh, that type of thing, um, basically with those other types of incidents, you still have to have symptoms, and for the case to be recordable, it has to meet one of the OSHA severity thresholds. So it's just the, um, the bloodborne exposure incidents that result from uh, a cut from a needle stick or a cut from a sharp that's uh, infect, uh, uh, that has potentially infectious material on it. And I, I'd like to also clarify another situation that we get a lot of uh, questions on. Um, if you have a case such as an individual cuts themselves uh, on a sharp object while at work, and obviously that's the case, and if it's, and it's work related, it happened on company premises, it's new. Um, and let's say the person then goes down to your medical department or goes to the emergency room or urgent care clinic. And because the person is diabetic, um, they're put on prescription antibiotics. You've got a case because you've got the, uh, the laceration. It happened at company, on company premises, so it's presumed to be work-related. It's a new case. And medical treatment was rendered in terms of having antibiotics. Now, one would say, well, this is you know, preventive because of infection because they are diabetic. Well, you've got the case, you've got work relationship, it's new, and giving the medications is, is considered medical treatment. Um, the question that was brought up about the individual that uh, asked the first question said that somebody was given medication just in case uh, they come down with something. Uh, again, if it's not bloodborne pathogen, then uh, that is not a recordable. So I hope you can see the distinction here. Uh, thank you, Pat. There's a, another quick question that has to do with bloodborne pathogens. Uh, maybe we can uh, quickly deal with that right now. Uh, and the questioner wonders whether a hepatitis B vaccination uh, would be recordable. Uh, yes, it's considered medical treatment. Uh, it's a prescription, it's considered medical treatment. So if someone gets an exposure, and they are given hepatitis B vaccination because they have never had it before, hepatitis B vaccination, that would be uh, a recordable case uh, under the bloodborne pathogen uh, exposures. Great, thanks. Um, here's another one, um, uh, uh, probably, uh, Pat, your best to answer this. How specific should the OSHA log be when recording occupational cancer or a significant illness, i.e., should occupational cancer be recorded or the specific diagnosis, uh, such as mesothelioma? Uh, for the OSHA log, they, they like you to be as specific as possible. So if it's mesothelioma, you should put that down on, on the OSHA log rather than just uh, occupational cancer. Always, always they look for you to be as specific as you're able to be. Now, get another example. Um, let's say you have a laceration of, of the um, First, uh, in, uh, index, let's say it's the index finger of the right hand. You wouldn't just put down uh, laceration of the right hand. You would say two centimeter laceration of the, uh, of the right index finger. Uh, 
regardless of whether it's occupational cancer, whether it's any other entity, they want you to be as descriptive as possible. Uh, we have another uh, bloodborne pathogen question, but this has to do with an exposure to a non-human primate, uh, say in a research facility. Uh, if an employee has an exposure to uh, the uh, monkey that potentially could carry a herpes B virus, and a medication uh, such as Voltrex is given as a preventive, uh, would that be considered recordable? Uh, yes, it would. Any time uh, that you're given a prescription medication for a bloodborne pathogen exposure, whether it's uh, from an inanimate object uh, or that has carried uh, biological fluids from an animal or from a human, it, it doesn't matter. You, you're, you're given an, a prescription medication. You would have to make that a recordable case. Yeah, the thing to keep in mind about the prescription meds is just like there was a finite list of, of uh, nine exceptions to work relationship, there's a finite list of 14 items that OSHA considers treatments that are first aid. And basically anything used beyond, the, you know, that is not on that list of 14, they consider to be medical treatment. Uh, and, and unless, you know, with prescription med medications, the, the difference is if you use a prescription solely for diagnostic purposes, like if you use an eye drop to facilitate, uh, that's a prescription eye drop to facilitate an eye exam, <clears throat> they would not consider that to be medical treatment. But their approach to, to using medicine is very broad and very inclusive. And so just to clarify, um, then, uh, bloodborne pathogen exposure covers uh, uh, no matter whose blood it is, whether it's human or uh, non-human? Well, it's potentially it's infectious material <clears throat> is the key. And the distinguishing things around bloodborne pathogens that are important is the exposure incident that, that caused the case. If it's a needle stick or a cut from a sharp, if it involves potentially infectious material, you record it no matter what. If it's a splash or another kind of exposure incident, you only record it if it meets one of the OSHA severity thresholds. But, but as Pat said, I mean, you know, if a prescription med is given, um, basically it's crossed that hurdle. And, and the, other, the other thing that would be analogous a little bit to the question is, is oh, like a bee sting, uh, although it's not a lumbar pathogen, but if you get a bee sting and you go down to your medical department or you go out to an emergency room and say, you know, I just got stung by a bee and I'm very highly allergic to, to bees, and they give you a shot, give you prescription medication, even though you're not having uh, a bad reaction at that point, you've got a case. You have norm abnormal condition disorder. You got stung. Uh, if it's work-related, it's new, uh, and you're meeting one of the severity criteria, you, you must record it. Um, so in that regard, uh, whether it's human or non-human, in the non-human sense, uh, you are, you're given the exposure. You have the case. It's work-related. It's new, and if you do a prescription item, just like a bee sting or, or a primate or whatever it is, you, you've, you've now hit the threshold of severity, uh, one of the severity criteria, and uh, you have a recordable case. Right. So there continue to be some uh, questions about um, uh, this issue in terms of potential exposures uh, to infectious materials. So this, this questioner is wondering if a case is recordable, if antibiotics are prescribed prophylactically for a potential exposure uh, to uh, an agent such as meningococcus uh, in a manufacturing facility, there have been no uh, specific wounds or injuries, or and the person is not ill. Just a uh, prophylactic uh, measure. Well, this this is a little different. This is not bloodborne pathogen. If someone has mere exposure, uh, you don't have a case. The case is an abnormal condition or disorder where you have signs or symptoms. So if somebody has mere exposures. Uh, to any type of virus or bacteria, or let's say, um, we're not talking about non-bloodborne pathogens now, uh, to a toxic chemical in the workplace. Maybe it's very toxic chemical uh, from a respiratory standpoint, and they have exposure to it. If they don't have any signs or symptoms, you don't have a case. So you stop right at that point. You don't have to worry about work relationship. You don't have to worry about new versus continuing. You don't have to worry about the severity criteria or whether they're getting something preventative, because you have to start out with a case. And, that, and that's why we train the way we do on this, where it's that kind of series of boxes or toggle switches. It's not only that you need to address those four, you should address them in the order that we provide them to you in that flow chart. Uh, 
So you know, Pat's right. If there's no case, if you do something that's preventive, more power to you. It's not reportable. It's not reportable. Uh, Steve, a uh, couple questions for you. Um, first uh, questioner wonders uh, uh, when an employer might be notified or if they're going to be included uh, in a, um, a record keeping audit and uh, if you know of all these audits, what, what percentage of them result in citations and or fines? Uh, that's a great question. Um, frankly, I think it depends on the area office. In short, <clears throat> when Federal OSHA comes up with a policy, it's driven through their regions and through their area offices. And, and frankly, I've had member companies contact me who are not on the NEP list, who are in the process of getting a records check inspection. I've called OSHA. And, and Federal OSHA said, well, we don't know why they're doing it because they're not on our list either. So I, I think the answer is, it really, you don't know. It's not like they're going to call you up and give you uh, two weeks' notice to prepare. You know, it, your notice might be a knock on the front door. Um, in terms of the results, that's a good question, too. And I, I asked the, uh, the guys at OSHA that, frankly, used to work for me how things are going. And they said so far the results uh, look pretty pretty good. You know that they haven't found uh, as significant underreporting as they thought they might. But they focused at least at the point that I contacted them, um, their results had been largely from smaller size sites. And my experience over the years is that small sites tend to overreport just to keep the government off their back. And larger sites are where you have problems. And even there. You know, the problems vary by industry, they vary by employer, and frankly, they vary, vary by site. So I, I don't think we, we know, you'll, you'll know when OSHA sh is going to show up. Um, plus, if they do a, a, a typical safety inspection, they can expand that to a records check inspection if they get in there and look at your records and think things don't smell right. The other thing is um, you really don't want to ever get fined by OSHA. Steve actually fined me uh, on a large uh, citation when I was working for a company, and um, uh, a two million dollar fine. And by by the time we finished, that was the direct cost. By the time we finished, it was uh, it was over 21 million uh, because we were required to go back in the settlement and redo some of our books for a couple of years and retrain everyone. And a bit 21 million dollars cost of the company. The other thing that's important, uh, why you really want to be careful about it, is because most of the board of directors hate adverse public relations. Yep. They don't want it in the papers that you are fined or potentially uh, have a citation. Um, because, quite frankly, when you go to court, there's a lot of things I think that uh, you can you know, argue with OSHA potentially, but the bad PR is already there. And you're not going to win all the cases with OSHA. You might win some, but the bad PR is already there, and it's going to be a very costly thing to, to go through an OSHA citation. Um, but Steve's right. He said, you'll know when they're, they're out to look because they'll come in for six, three to six weeks, eight weeks maybe, with a team of people to look at your records. So um, that's when you really start to, to be concerned that there may be some problems. The other, the other thing is we don't, we don't have time to dive too deeply on this stuff, but there are other actions that are underway by OSHA that are increasing the pressure on the system. And one is <clears throat> they're taking the data they collect from employers and basically posting it on the OSHA website. They're doing that uh, along with the results of OSHA inspections, results of OSHA fatality and, and serious injury uh, inspections. Um, and there's, there's proposed legislation. It's the uh, Injury and Fatality Reporting Act. I think it's H.R. 2113, where the agency would require employers to provide their OSHA injury and illness data by site and for the company as a whole, and also provide their compliance history by site and as a company for the company as a whole, and then post that information on the internet. That's what OSHA is interested in doing. So, so there's Pat's right. I mean, you know, the the visibility and the transparency of this stuff is increasing kind of exponentially, and I think as a result, you know, there are going to be some sites that are hit hard. And, and one of the things that bugs me about this is in some companies, you know, either the, the doc or nurse or safety person ends up being the designated spear catcher when things turn sour. And so, uh, you know, if things can turn sour very quickly with this. Steve, uh, certainly in my experience, one of the uh, more common areas of discomfort for physicians have to do with uh, 
giving uh, auditors access to uh, medical records. And um, one of the questioners um, asked that if OSHA comes on site is doing a medical record review, uh, uh, are we, presumably as physicians, uh, required to allow them access to non-work-related medical records? Uh, and, you know, obviously are there any what are the, the what are the confidential confidentiality laws around this? Well, that's a great qu uh, question, and and frankly, you're you're not required to unless they come on site with a medical access order or an administrative subpoena. But if they flash those at you, you are required to. Now, um, as I, I think I mentioned briefly in, in my remarks, there we're all aware of HIPAA and the impact that HIPAA is supposed to have on people accessing our personal medical information. But there is an ex a specific exception in the HIPAA rules for OSHA record keeping, believe it or not. Um, so the agency can and will access this. F frankly, in, in other sessions I do, I, I cover past cases where OSHA has issued large dollar penalties. And um, I think it's probably not a good strategic move to deny them access to something they have legal authority to get anyway, because ultimately they're going to get it. And by the time they get it, they're going to be ticked off. So um, you, you are, in a way, between a rock and a hard place. I would not give them access to personal medical information unless they produce a medical access order or a subpoena that, that provides them that authority. Uh, but once they produce the right documentation, you have to. Uh, great. Well, you guys are um, generating even more questions. For every, every answer you give, I get two more questions. So, Pat, this is a favorite uh, one of, a topic of yours uh, relating to foreign bodies and eyes. Uh, the specific questioner, specific question is does, use a, is, does the use of a prescription eye drop anesthetic uh, to assist in removing uh, a foreign body with a cotton swab uh, make this recordable, and you might want to uh, just discuss the issue of foreign bodies and eyes more more generally. Right. Well, the um, issue of foreign bodies is, is, is uh, very interesting. Uh, it's first aid for removal of foreign bodies uh, is cotton swabs to remove the foreign body or flushing the eye to remove the foreign body. Anything else used to remove the foreign body such as an ice bud or an 18-gauge needle, uh, is considered medical treatment. Now, why I've always been upset with OSHA is that uh, a, wet, a wetted cotton swab really disrupts the cornea, and you're much better using an ice bud or an 18-gauge needle. However, again, uh, by using the um, uh, ice bud or 18-gauge needle, you just bought yourself a recordable case. I always do what's right for the patient, and I think we should do that first, even though it may make the case recordable. But again, First aid for removal of foreign bodies of the eye is flushing it out or, or a cotton swab only. Now, in terms of the medications, uh, if you give a person some medications to numb the eye to remove the foreign body, uh, that is a recordable case. The only time you can use uh, medication in the eye, uh, such as numbing the eye, is if you're doing it strictly and solely to aid in your examination. If you chart, I gave two drops. Uh, a vaccine or whatever you're going to use to numb the person's eye in order to aid my investigation to, to be diagnostic and so I could look in the eye so the patient was comfortable. In that case, if that's the sole reason you gave them the uh, medication, then, then it's uh, uh, not recordable. But if you use it to decrease their pain, if you use it in order to aid you in terms of the extraction of the foreign body, it's considered um, uh, prescription medication and uh, a recordable case. Same questioner wants to put a fine point on that, um, not to make a pun, um, and that is, is that uh, let's say that uh, he or she has used this prescription eye drop uh, to examine the eye, and then lo and behold, they're in the eye and they find a foreign body, and then they remove that foreign body with a cotton swab. Well, oh, it, 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 that's a good question. It, it goes on terms of your documentation. If you, and I'm not trying to tell you to document uh, something that's not true, but if you place that one drop of eye drops was given to the individual to aid in the examination of the eye, and uh, that's the way it's charted, and that's what you do, if in the fact in the end you end up uh, finding a foreign body because you're able now to get a good exam and remove it with a cotton swab or, or you're able to flush it out, I wouldn't consider you having a recordable. Uh, but if you put in the medical record, I gave a drop of anesthetic to the eye in order to aid uh, 
evaluation and diagnostic uh, work for the eye, as well as to aid in the removal of the foreign body, then you've got yourself a, a recordable. It's got to be solely for diagnostic purposes. So if that was your intent, if you find something then, of course, you're going to go ahead and remove it. If you remove it by fleshing it out or remove it by cotton swab, you're fine. You don't have a recordable case. You know, that, that brings up an interesting point in that I said earlier we, I touched on, on documentation. And really, the, the thing to do whenever you can and you're documenting why you did not record a borderline case, use OSHA's language and feed it right back to them. You know, so you could say, well, in, in your documentation, you go, we didn't record this case uh, because it wasn't work-related. And, you know, that's a loser. That, that doesn't help you at all. You know, if you said something like, we didn't record this case, because it resulted from an event or exposure outside of the work environment uh, that had nothing to do with work. You know, you're, you're basically taking one of OSHA's principles and feeding it right back to them. And, and that's the same with this eye scenario. Is yeah, that you the, put you in there in your documentation that was solely for diagnostic purposes. Exactly. Fine. If, if you don't document it properly, chances are by the time OSHA inspects your record, somebody else is going to be doing the record keeping stuff and, and uh, you know, it will be hard to recall what was done and that's when the citations get issued because when OSHA audits records, most of the time they're just looking at paper. Yeah, if you, even, if you, even if you truly were giving that eye drop solely for diagnostic purposes and OSHA came in and looked at the record and didn't find that you didn't, that you didn't document it, at that point just telling them, oh, that was just for diagnostic purposes, if it wasn't written in your medical record at the time that it was done, you're probably going to lose that case. So documentation is absolutely key. Uh, there's some questions about uh, the flu, uh, and I'll, I'd like to add some of my own uh, experience with this. But uh, first I ask uh, uh, you guys, uh, this is a question, if there's a death due to H1N1, is this uh, considered a reportable fatality, uh, a reportable ASAP? It can be. The, 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 the key there, remember, every case you have to work through the through those four steps that Pat and I talked about. Um, and the key there would be, um, was there an exposure in the work environment that contributed to the case? And in situations involving illness where it's unclear, you ask yourself, is it more likely than not that the case resulted from an event or exposure in the work environment? Now, I, and when it comes to H1N1, you know, OSHA believes in most situations, the answer to that is it's not more likely than not. And so in a, let's say in a manufacturing setting where none of the other workers, uh, your coworkers, were sick with the same virus, um, they would not consider it work-related and not consider the fatality recordable. But if you, you had somebody working in a healthcare setting where they likely were exposed and they hadn't been inoculated, then they would consider work-related and you, and you could have an OSHA recordable around H1N1. And if it results in death, then you've got a recordable fatality. Just to expand a bit on the, the common cold and flu um, exception, I've had some personal experience with, again, how um, narrowly that is interpreted. Uh, we had a, an outbreak in uh, my uh, medical center of what we initially thought was uh, pertussis. It turned out uh, with investigation not to be pertussis, but essentially a, a mix of uh, common uh, community respiratory viruses, um, which um, we did not record. Uh, we were subject to a medical record audit, and uh, OSHA's conclusion was that we should have recorded uh, what it amounted to be, I believe it was something in the range of 120 cases, because we acted as if this were, was a, um, uh, a workplace uh, uh, transmission and uh, actually were treating people uh, with um, uh, with medications, and even though in the end, kind of scientifically, if you will, this was not uh, anything but a common mix of uh, respiratory illnesses, um, OSHA uh, felt as though we should have recorded because we acted as if it was a workplace um, transmission. Wow. That's, uh, uh, so, you know, I, for me, I think that's kind of overreaching there, but, you know, one of the challenges, too, in dealing, but it brings up a good point, Bob, and that's that you know, that, frankly, the, the training and expertise of the OSHA person who comes on site to look at your records could vary significantly. And, uh, you, you know, if you've suffered through one of these, particularly the long course that Pat and I teach, you probably know this stuff better than 
some of the OSHA compliance officers. And so some of them think they know, um, but, I, but I get examples, I won't say every day, but at least on a, on a weekly basis where OSHA comes in and is prepared to cite somebody for something that technically I don't think is OSHA recordable. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of problems, especially with the state, the ATB states, the, the oh, state yeah. OSHA plans that the uh, examiners just really aren't schooled in OSHA record keeping. And a lot of times they'll give uh, totally erroneous answers. Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, Pat, we have another uh, eye question, uh, and this is essentially the use of a, a medical device to flush the eye, essentially using a Morgan lens. Well, uh, I'd, have, I'd have to look at the uh, first aid list. First aid list says if you remove a uh, foreign body by, by flushing. Uh, uh, cotton swab or other simple means. Yeah, right. and so I would consider. I'd have to look at that. That's a very good question. I would think that the Morgan lens is is, is flushing the eye with, with fluid, and I would tend to think that's first aid. Steve, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, to me, it's it's whether or not that would be interpreted as kind of a simple means, and I, and I think you could. I, I don't think OSHA's ever written an interpretation letter on that, so you know, I think that could, that could be open to interpretation. One one thing to um, it's great that we're kind of having a dialogue here because as we mentioned. As these questions come in, and by the way, folks, these are great questions. Um, it spurs on different thoughts that, that we have about diff different issues. And so, you know, on that one, I mean, I think it really boils down to if OSHA has not written an interpretation letter that's specific to that issue, you can make a reasonable interpretation. And the point I wanted to make was when OSHA issues citations on record keeping, <clears throat> they usually don't smoke you for one or two cases. They're looking for patterns. And so the you know the big dollar cases that Pat and I are talking about, it's not when one case or you know particularly uh, let's say that on, on that case you decided that it was not OSHA recordable, and you said you're basing your decision on the fact that it was a, it was it was uh, a simple means, um, and it's addressed by the OSHA first aid list, although not specifically mentioned. I think the worst that would happen would be that an OSHA compliance officer would come in and tell you to change it. Well, and, and Steve, uh, looking at the finite first aid list. It says removing a foreign body from an eye with only irrigation or a cotton swab. So right. a Morgan lens, uh, if you're using it to, to just to irrigate it and, and, and the foreign body is just to move that way, I would say that that's, you know, your irriga it's irrigation. Yeah, I agree. You hold a squeeze bottle in your hand or, or uh, you hold your head under a faucet or whatever, you've got, you've got irrigation here. So I would take that as first aid at this point. Yep. So let's move from the eyes to the ears and have uh, a couple of uh, questions there. Um, First is, uh, does bilateral work-related hearing loss result in two separate OSHA recordables, i.e., one for each ear? It could. It really depends upon uh, when the loss was incurred. So, you know, you could have um, – I, I, I think the – we usually deal with the opposite uh, issue, don't we, Pat, where usually somebody will say, well, we only had hearing loss in one ear, so it can't be work-related. Um, and that certainly isn't the case. I would, so I, I think would with, get, like with anything point. else, you'd have to do an assessment as to whether or not, you know, when the person exceeded the thresholds and whether or not uh, both ears were affected at that time. If, if you're doing – the way I handled this in the past is when you're doing the annual uh, hearing exam and, and both ears have a standard threshold shift, then my diagnosis is bilateral, uh, uh, you know, SDS in both ears bilaterally, and that is a one case. Right. Um, and then I change the baseline for each year. Um, if it happens in your right ear this year and next year it happens in the left, I think you have two cases then. Yep. But I think if, I think that when you're doing your annual hearing uh, exam, if you get uh, bilateral uh, SDSs that are persistent, then I would I would consider that one case. Yeah, I agree. Um, another hearing uh, que uh, hearing question um, related to work relatedness. And so let's assume that a company uh, puts uh, their employees um, into a hearing conservation program because of uh, potential exposure to loud noises at work. Uh, and then someone who has actually is in the program but, but is, uh, I assume, documented to have minimal noise exposure has an STS, uh, would OSHA consider this as a work-related um, event because the person was in the program? They wouldn't do it because of the, the person was in the program. But remember, one of the things they did 
was when they issued a new rule in 2001, they changed the way hearing loss and work relationship were dealt with. And that prior to 2001, there was a presum presumption that if somebody worked in a high noise environment, an 85 dB time weighted average noise environment, the case was work related. Now what OSHA did when, when it revised the rule in 2001, it, it basically said, well, we're going to do away with that presumption. And basically all you have to do is apply <clears throat> the normal work relationship rules that you have for other cases to your hearing cases. And I think a lot of companies misunderstood that and felt that, well, gee, that means we're going to have fewer OSHA recordables. In fact, the agency expected the OSHA recordables to go up, and they didn't. So hearing loss, I'm glad the questionnaire asked that question because I think that's one of the focus area, areas that OSHA is going to look at when they come in and do a records check inspection. So remember, for work relationship for all cases now, including hearing loss, um, the, the case doesn't have to primarily be caused by an exposure in the work environment. There has to be an event or exposure in the work environment that contributes even slightly to the case. And, and unfortunately, um, because now if you have a person that's not exposed to high levels of noise, um, a, lot of, a lot of companies who used to do, uh, do uh, screening exams on every employee as good public health now is limiting their, their hearing uh, uh, annual exams and people in the program, the hearing conservation program, to people that are exposed to 85 decibels or higher on a time-weighted average. That's very unfortunate. Again, uh, it's driving the wrong type of thing that we want. I'd rather see everybody in the plant get it because there's so much noise pollution from people wearing hearing plugs and so forth to listen to their music nowadays. It's, it's unfortunate that a lot of companies now are dropping uh, screening everyone and making part of the hearing conservation program unless they're uh, exposed to 85 uh, or higher. Hey, Bob, while, while we're touching on this, let me, let me just toss this in, too. Cause okay, just, just real quickly, because we do have to address the CME question here. All right, I will. It, it has to do with hearing loss cases, and I think it's a trap. I don't think it was intentionally set, but I do think it's a trap for employers in that there is a, a criteria in the OSHA rule about work relationship and hearing loss that says that the employer can get a medical opinion that the case is not work-related, the hearing loss case. And if they do, they don't have to record it. A lot of companies were sending people to audiologists who were saying they didn't think it was work-related and not recordable. They could still get cited. Why? Because the medical opinion that it's not work-related has to be based on the OSHA rules. And OSHA didn't make that clear until they issued a, a letter of interpretation in August of 2007. So that could be a real trap for companies. Great. Thanks. Well, um, this has been a, a very robust uh, conversation, and uh, I know that there are unanswered questions. Um, I'd uh, suggest that people contact uh, the speakers whose contact information was available uh, on one of the earlier slides. Uh, but before we close, we want to um, address the CME questions uh, and the answers. So I think, Pat, you're going to be doing that? I'll do that very quickly because we have about two minutes, I think. Thanks, Bob. Um, the uh, first one, the OSHA record keeping process consists of the four basic steps, uh, case, work relationship, new, and if it meets one of the specific severity uh, criteria in that, that's, that's a true statement. According to case in the OSHA log does not mean, uh, does not mean I can't, I, let's see here, I'm trying to read it here. The case is covered by workers' compensation, the case is preventable, benefits are due to the employee, all, a worker, all of the above. Doesn't mean all of the above. Um, this one, routine job functions, activities, the work of reforms at least once a week. Okay, and that's important you understand what, what routine job functions have to do with uh, restricted work activity in which the individual uh, can't work their entire shift or can't perform uh, an activity they do once per week. That's very important for restricted work activity. The NEP, or National Emphasis Program, expires September 30th of 2010. However, you know, they're going to continue on doing uh, audits of individuals, and I would really suggest looking at the criteria that they use, because if you can do the National Emphasis Program auditing criteria, you can pass at your company at any time. I think it would be, do very well in terms of an audit in the future. And the answer here is a surveillance system. That's it was really developed as a surveillance system. Uh, lastly, I want to mention again there's the pre-conference at the uh, AOHC meeting, American Occupational Health Conference meeting in Orlando on 
On Saturday, May 1st, Steve and I will be, and another colleague of ours, will be conducting a full day uh, pre-conference session on OSHA record keeping. It'll be in depth. Uh, we'll go through case analysis, mechanics, and a lot of the detail that we weren't able to cover today, as well as very good Q&A, and I think we have some good Q&A today. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all of you for your attendance and the presenters for their valuable presentation. This does conclude today's program. You may disconnect. Speakers, please stay online. I'll transfer you within a few seconds.